Thanks a lot. Good morning. I'm Herman Berliner, and I'm Dean of the Zarb School of Business at Hofstra University. Our speaker this morning is, is, is highly qualified. Uh, Bob McGinnis, who's a graduate of Dartmouth, is the global account director for Duffy Agencies, a digital marketing firm whose sole focus is helping mid-sized brands experience fast growth across multiple borders. Duffy Agency has worked and continues to work with the U.S. Commercial Service to enter markets in Vietnam and Europe. Sean Duffy, founder of the Duffy Agency, participated as a speaker in the U.S. Uh, Commercial Service's Discover Global Market Series on e-commerce last year. And Bob is closely collaborating with the newly formed U.S. Commercial Service's e-commerce expert council. Uh, very important work. Bob has been speaking for over 20 years on creating effective marketing strategies and driving response. He's conducted thousands of seminars throughout the United States, Europe, and Central America. Is focused on providing clients interested in growing abroad with the bottom line revenue results that they are looking for. Pleasure for me to introduce Bob McGinnis. Morning, everybody. Well, to answer probably everybody's biggest question, yes, I was about 10 pounds lighter in that picture. <laughs> so, I want to thank uh, U.S. Commercial Service and uh, Hofstra University's uh, Zarb School of Business for having me here today. Yeah, we, we only, our agency only specializes in helping brands cross borders. And I've been to a lot of seminars that talk about how to grow uh, our cross borders. And a lot of them share fantastic tactics about uh, how to increase your uh, search rank or uh, increase your followers or how to uh, improve conversion rates. Um, but today what I'd like to do is talk more about strategy and how that fits into entering foreign markets. So I have a lot of different examples to show you today. Some of them are ours, many of them, most of them are ours, some of them are not. But um, I thought maybe what I would do is talk, at least start with, um, a brand that unless you've flown in from another country, we probably all know. Target has uh, clean stores and they have well-known brands and they have uh, friendly and helpful staff. They have everything going for them, which would, would mean, you would think, a, a universal formula for succeeding. So when they decided to go into Canada a few years back in uh, 2013, Everybody thought, well, they'll probably repeat their success in the U.S. and Canada. So, yeah, in March of 2013, they went up into Canada. As you probably know, they opened about 100 stores, and uh, everything worked out wonderfully for them. Uh, no, actually, within two years, they, uh, they were gone. They, they closed. At that point, they had 133 stores, um, and they had 17,000 employees. They, they fired in, in Canada. So, uh, and you know, they were no slouches. They have uh, 350,000 employees in the U.S. They do $70 billion in sales every year. They're number 36 on the Fortune 500. They know their stuff and they had trouble. In fact, Forbes magazine, they actually explained it as the retailer failed to entice shoppers in Canada, a country of 36 million people with a way of life similar to Americans but with habits different enough to make it a potential minefield for uh, U.S. retailers. So, uh, and the Harvard Business Review actually did a story recently, they did a study with, of 20,000 U.S. businesses, small, mid-sized, not just these giant multi-billion dollar companies, and what they found is the vast majority failed when they were trying to enter other markets. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about today is that most of these businesses, at least we find, they don't fail because they don't, they're not using good digital marketing tactics. It's usually what we find a, a larger, more fundamental problem and strategy. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, and the nice thing about strategy is that it never changes. Tactics are always changing. But strategy kind of remains the same from year to year. And if you can master these principles, a lot of these things you can do yourself, do internally with some unique different approaches. And some of the tactics you can always outsource, but it's very difficult to outsource your strategic vision and, uh, and guidance. So, and then of course, some brands just should not be traveling at all. And uh, if you've ever been to Sweden, you would know this brand. 
This is callous. It's like Skippy peanut butter is to the U.S. It's in every single household. Whenever I travel to Sweden, we have a, an office in Sweden, uh, the hotel, the buffet always has this. Um, what it is, it's fish eggs served out of a toothpaste tube uh, for breakfast and all different flavors you can get it in. This one's banana. And my guess is that uh, banana flavored caviar squeezed out of a tube for breakfast may not be your idea of something that might travel well. So, uh, however, if uh, you're not serving caviar out of a tube, maybe some of these strategies might, uh, uh, might resonate. So, what can go wrong? When we think about cross-cultural marketing blunders, these are usually the things that we think about, aren't they? Parker Penn, it won't leak in your pocket and make you pregnant. Uh, Coors Light, suffer from diarrhea. These are all back translations. The, the, the brands translated them and then we back translated, they back translated them and this is what they got. These all actually happened. Um, American Airlines, fly naked. Back in the 50s, my mother was a flight attendant for American Airlines, so that's especially disturbing to see for me. Um, Coca-Cola, bite the wax tadpole. Clairol, manure stick. It's a mist stick, you know, the curling iron? But uh, in German, mist means manure, so they, they had a little trouble there. Um, the silver mist, the Rolls-Royce car, had some trouble going into Germany as well. They had to change it to the silver shadow. Um, Irish mist never gained a lot of traction in Germany, as you can imagine. Now, I, these are all a little amusing, but um, the thing is, is that things like this aren't the things that kill brands when they're trying to travel. They're just little hiccups. Clearly, none of these brands had problems with that. I mean, they're still at the top of their category. It's these invisible things, these hidden things that you never see. Those are the things that kill you, and those are the things that I want to talk about today. And, and I'm going to talk about ten different tips, but really they all kind of, they're different flavors of one tip, which is understand the market that you're entering and bear that difference in mind with every single decision that you're going to make. Which means that everybody in your organization who's helping also needs to understand that or at least be well directed. So seek understanding, insight, and do your due diligence. Which means usually putting people on airplanes and actually visiting the countries that you're going into. And you know, we live in this information age where it's so easy just to do desktop research. We have all this, this data and statistics and we see so many brands just try to figure things out over here and then go into other countries and that never wins the day. It, it always causes problems. So why don't I get into a few, uh, a few tips here. Number one, don't translate. Now, most likely, if you're going into other countries, you're going to need to translate your work into other languages. However, the last person you usually want to contact is a translator. There's really a whole broad spectrum of people you can use to translate, as I'm sure you know. On the left side of the spectrum is the, the translator. They're linguistic experts. They're focused on execution. They don't have very good writing skills. Typically, they have no advertising skills, but they're really good at just translating into another language clearly. Um, and there's a, certainly a whole range of translators you can use from translation houses to Google Translate. And, um, but basically, translation is good for simple communication, down and dirty, just get it done, but it's not suited for mass communication. For that, we usually recommend the other two. And, and if actually, you look at a copywriter, if you hire an agency in another country to translate your work, Copywriters are creatives. They're really good at advertising. They're really good at motivating people to do things, to get them to do things, but they're creators. So what we find when we use agencies in other countries, that copywriters too often will try to make something completely different and new. So which brings us to that middle category, the adapters. And those are really the ones you want to use. They have really good linguistic skills. They have really good writing skills. And they have some advertising skills as well. But what they're able to do is to preserve the clarity and the message and the, the, the selling spirit of the ad. And, and I'll give you an example. We worked um, on the Saab account globally for many years. And one of the ideas with adaptation is just write the best in whatever language you're in. Write the best English, write the best Spanish. Um, and you know, some people ask you to write mid-Atlantic English, which is basically 
them asking you to write bad English that resonates with nobody, but it's kind of easy to translate, and, and we don't recommend that. And uh, this is an example of an ad that was launching in the U.S. when, when uh, they were launching the Cabriolet. And at that time in the U.S., if you remember but way back when oxygen bars were really the thing, at least in California, um, and so we thought that this headline would do well with their convertible. And it did wonderfully. We knew it wouldn't be able to be translated in under, into other languages well, but that didn't matter to us. We just wanted to resonate with, with our targets in the U.S. So uh, this is what we had in the U.S. Now, we knew that it, when we went into other countries like Sweden, we wouldn't be able to do that. So <laughs> this is what we did. We didn't use a translator. We used an adapter, a transcreator, and even though he, it's in Swedish, I'm sure you can understand what it says, Sam versus claustrophobia. Completely different word, could never have been translated oxygen bar into claustrophobia, but it preserved the idea. And this was a really good transcreator that we use. So the idea is, just to sum up, avoid translation for mass communication, distinguish between translators, transcreators, the adapters, and the creators, the copywriters, Optimize the copy for each language. Uh, focus on conveying the ideas into other, the other cultural context, not just the words, and uh, get back translations. So uh, another thing to do is, uh, and we, we find that a lot of uh, brands get tripped up with the difference between sales and marketing, and, and it comes up again and again, when, especially when you're dealing with different markets. This is our definition. Uh, marketing is responsible for generating, nurturing, and retaining leads whereas sales is responsible for converting and closing leads. So if we look at the equity cycle, really everything above trial is marketing. And if you start using sales techniques in your marketing, that's where you get into trouble. If you start using sales techniques with your social media, for example, or your content marketing, that's usually when it's not quite as effective. And the other way is, is a problem too, you know, of course, when you have marketers involved in your sales process. Another point that we have learned is don't focus on quality. I know that might sound a little counterintuitive, but I'll give you an example. Back when CDs and DVDs were being produced, these huge production houses were making blank CDs and DVDs, early on there were errors. So this whole industry strung, uh, sprung up of the machines that would actually check and make sure that these blank media were right before they shipped them off to Sony or something. And, you know, a disaster happened and they lost the big contract. So uh, we were actually called by the producer on the left, those big machines. They had these amazing machines that could test CDs and DVDs and see if they were right. They could measure a hundred different metrics. They could look down to basically the molecule and tell you if anything was off. And they called us when their uh, sales started to level off and they weren't sure why, and what we noticed quickly enough was that this machine on the right, which was made in China, had come out and that they were their biggest threat. It only measured three things instead of a hundred things, but it was five times cheaper. That's what we thought the problem was. And so we went to the, to the company, and it was run by engineers, as sometimes they are, and they all said, they laughed and said, there is no way that they are a threat. We measure a hundred things, they only measure Three and um, of course, what had happened was the technology had advanced, and the machines that would make these uh, this blank media started evolving, and they became more accurate. But the Chinese people actually got in planes and they flew out and they talked to the producers and they asked them what kept them up at night, and there were only three things that they worried about, and that was the three things that were in the machine on the right. And three years later, the company on the left was. Uh, was out of business. So really the point here is, and the thing to really bear in mind is that markets never respond to quality because quality is completely subjective. Isn't it? They only respond to value and that's really the difference between what I give and what I get. The difference between my resources and what my needs are. So um, really important when entering other markets. It's an easy way to trip up. Number four, assume everything is different. You know, this is something called the Hofstede Cultural Equivalency Scale. And as it turns out, there really is a way to quantify the differences between different cultures. And for example, in this one, it's the difference between the United States and China. And if you look at the third set over, masculinity, you'll notice that actually the Chinese and the, the US 
men in this case, are fairly similar in terms of the differences between um, men and women, or the differences that are kind of tolerated in terms of uh, assertiveness and competitiveness. But if you look at China versus France, there's kind of a major difference there in masculinity. And the reason I bring that up is because uh, L'Oreal and Clarins uh, launched two, each launched a product in China a number of years ago. And L'Oreal did, did a great job and uh, Clarins failed. And a study was done afterwards and what happened was that the Chinese men said they couldn't relate to the Clarins brand, whereas they felt the opposite for L'Oreal. They thought that it was easy to relate to and that they were inspired by it. Uh, and when you look at what they did, L'Oreal, the French company, they used a Chinese man and his idea of an aspirational man. And they did this just by grabbing a macho celebrity and using him in their communications. This is Takichi Cachanero, singer and actor in 2003, Time Magazine, coined him the Asian Johnny Depp. So he uh, probably remember him from House of Flying Daggers and Chungking Express and Ain't It Cool News. But in any case, what Clarence did is instead of using the Chinese version of an aspirational man, what a, what a Chinese man aspired to, they just used their own Parisian idea of what an aspirational man was, and uh, they used the metrosexual. And uh, the Chinese men looked at uh, this guy, and they just simply couldn't wrap their head around it. Uh, they didn't know who he was, but they didn't want to look like him or smell like him, and so uh, bear that in mind when uh, when crossing borders. So, uh, okay. Uh, don't count on reason. Does everybody know what methadone is? Yeah, methadone is what uh, is used to help heroin addicts get off of heroin. Unfortunately, more people die of methadone than actually heroin itself. So it can cause all sorts of problems. And so uh, we were approached and we worked with a pharmaceutical company that made buprenorphine. And buprenorphine has all these incredible advantages over methadone. Um, as you can see, uh, there's much less of a cardiac risk. Not that you can read this. There's uh, much better cognitive function when you're on methadone. You get a little loopy. There's very little um, uh, possibility of a drug interaction. Many heroin addicts, because they're heroin addicts, have all sorts of other um, uh, problems where they're taking medication for, and methadone can interact with that. So uh, detox. Methadone is actually harder to, to get over than uh, heroin itself, whereas uh, buprenorphine actually is that much easier, that it's easier than both of them. So we had all these benefits, all these value propositions, and we were sitting in our office, we had all this incredible research and data, and we were trying to pick which one do we go with. And, and then, of course, we realized that we do what we always do, and we don't just guess, we ask. And so we flew to Brixton, a suburb of London, which, uh, very depressed, had a good amount of heroin addicts, and we just sat and we interviewed them. And they gave us just amazing insights and very clearly thought out ones, well articulated, and uh, what we found was it was none of them. It was actually willpower. When you take this pill, it blocks your heroin receptors, and, the, and no matter what you do that day, no matter how much heroin you take, it doesn't work. So what the heroin addict said is that, I only have to have five minutes of willpower in the morning. If I can take this pill, I'm good for the day. And it wasn't the most logical for us, but when we went out and we asked, that's what we found, and that, was the, that made all the difference. Think national, not regional. We helped Ally, it's a US drug company, makes Ally. Um, this is a diet pill. We helped them launch in Europe. And when we were first contacted by uh, this client in the US, the strategy was that they would use a London-based agency uh, to roll this out in Europe because if they were from London, they must know Europe, everything about Europe. <laughs> so so um, I, this is a common mistake, I think, by people, by brands, even big brands like this one. They look at Europe as a whole region. Uh, they look at Asia as a whole region, uh, and they don't really appreciate the differences between 
the, the different countries. And uh, we knew women's ideas, and this was targeted towards women, we knew women's ideas towards their body and towards taking pills and towards dieting in general was different in every single country in Europe. So we had to reposition this brand differently in every single country. And when we talk about web architecture, it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? You can have a global website that's in English that goes to the whole world. You can have a national website that's just targeted towards Germans, or a provincial one, even better, that's targeted just to, towards Berliners, uh, or even better, that sounds like a good idea? Yeah, there's something for the Berliners out there, or even better for the Hans Schmitz out there, the one-to-one -one websites, which are a little ways off, maybe 10 to 15 uh, years, but that's really the ultimate goal, isn't it? The place where brands get into trouble are these uh, regional and sub-regional websites. Nobody ever identifies themselves as an EMEAN or as a Northern European, but a lot of brands tend to categorize their uh, websites, or at least the targets they're going after, into different brands like that, into different categories like that, or regions like that, so be careful with that. Um, don't underestimate the advantage of the home team. We've covered that with target number seven. Um, centralize your brand and marketing strategy. We worked with this big electronics firm. They did some business in Australia. And this is the mascot that was launching in Australia for this major, major brand. Um, and there was nothing they, we could do about them using this mascot, which had nothing to do with this big electronics company. They had hired a local marketing and distribution company and they had signed away their rights and they, let, they could do anything they pleased with their branding and marketing and of course they went off and started something completely new uh, in their own way. So your operational structure as you start to grow, uh, branch out into other markets, it's really important because if you don't set it up right, it'll be pretty much impossible for you to control your brand outside the home market and you won't experience the growth that um, you were hoping for. Don't pack your corporate ego. I don't know if you were one of the ones that was lined up on the LIE 20 years ago or whenever that was when IKEA opened. <laughs> Remember that? Uh, new experience. We handled uh, the IKEA account for years and years. In the 80s and early 90s, we were their agency and did all their catalogs, those catalogs that uh, were uh, were everywhere, uh, and we were locked in this battle with them about selling beds, how they were selling beds. When we helped them launch in the United States, they sold king size and queen size beds as we understand them to be, as we use the word, but they were different sizes. So uh, you can only imagine how frustrating it was when you would go into Ikea and get some bed sheets and you go home and you try to you know, <laughs> fit them on the beds and they wouldn't quite reach to the edge. And uh, it was even worse because many states in the United States won't, won't accept that it's illegal to return bed clothing. So, um, and this was not just with beds. This was across the board. Europeans, as I'm sure you know, tend to use smaller portion size, smaller glasses. And it was famously known that uh, when IKEA opened in the States that they were selling a lot of bases. You heard that? You heard that? <laughs> Disproportionately large amount of bases. And you know why they were buying them? Or drinking glasses. Yeah. So, uh, so we went back and forth, and it was just a big argument with them. Um, and they kept saying no, and they finally said, look, we are not going to change the size of our beds in the United States. We will learn the Americans what the proper bed size is. <laughs> and, and, you know, not long from then, they almost pulled out of the U.S. They came in in the 80s, and by the 90s, they were about to pull out. And that's when they changed their bed sizes. And the, the month that they changed their bed sizes, their bed sales went up 700%. Just by making that change, just by listening to the market. So the message there really is if you're trying to sell your Hoggins on mattresses and Sunvik uh, beds and Ludrat beer glasses, maybe check with the Americans first to see what they would like. So. Uh, Last but not least, um, get stakeholders on board. About a year ago, we were approached by a, a fine art gallery. They have a gallery in uh, LA and New York. They sell sculptures and, and paintings. Um, and they had hit the ceiling of about $3 million domestically and abroad. 
and they couldn't get past it, and they approached us um, to try to just get some growth. And, and it wasn't very aggressive growth they were looking for. They were only looking for 65% growth within the next three years. So we looked at their product, and we were surprised that it actually offered a lot of value compared to their competitors. And um, that was surprising to us because markets usually gravitate towards value, kind of like how water gravitates to low ground, unless it's being actively diverted somewhere. So uh, the next place we looked then was with their digital performance, because what we find is that with most companies today, um, they're underutilizing their digital to, to drive growth. They had an e-commerce site, and they were active on social media, but of course active and um, effective are two different things, and it was showing up in their results. So uh, what they decided was, of course, is that digital didn't work for them, that people didn't buy fine art online. But it really didn't make any sense to us. One reason it didn't make any sense to us is because of this. Online fine art sales was going through the roof and is actually going to continue to go through the roof uh, to, to the year 2000. So, I mean, the year 2020. So, uh, we didn't really understand why they were having trouble. But we started looking at the numbers. What we found is that they really started to take off. They opened their e-commerce site in 2010 and they really started growing at a pretty aggressive rate and they should have kept going, but uh, in the first quarter of 2012, it's, their trend started reversing, and they didn't know why, and so we dug deeper, and you know what we found? We found in, in the first quarter of 2012, actually to that day that we're looking at there, um, a competitor had launched, an online art gallery, totally complete digital entity, um, and they were stealing away all their traffic. You know, for an e-commerce site, when, you, when people are stealing your traffic, they're basically taking away your sales. So actually, that $3.4 million that you see in the red there, that's actually the price they paid for letting their digital guard down. Uh, but we also saw it as a big opportunity. And it, this was an easy fix. And we knew how to fix it. And we knew that when we fixed it, it would probably yield more than that 65% uh, that they initially had asked for. So, uh, so we started kind of looking at things and projecting things. And the nice thing about digital is because it's so measurable, it's easy to pr project um, and predict ahead of time what's going to happen. And we found if they did nothing, except just kept going the way that they were going, which was really just ad work campaigns, that they would bring in another $2.6 million in the next four years. And then we thought, well, you know, what if we did nothing but just worked a little smarter? Just market is smarter. Didn't even spend more money. What we found is that if they could just take their 0.11% conversion rate, which is really like a tenth of 1%, and bump it up just to a half of 1%, that it would result in a dramatic increase in their revenue. And then we thought, okay, well, if we did that, in fact, if we could bump it up to just 1%, and then really drive some traffic to them, which again, isn't very difficult to do, they could uh, experience some real dramatic gains, and they could get up to almost $24 million in those four years. And these are things that are very predictable and easy to, easy to control. And I should point out that if you look at our logo, Duffy Agency, see how the agency is flipped? Most agencies, they kind of charge for building things. And so a lot of their strategies involve building things. We actually do it a different way. We charge for strategy, but when, we, when it comes time for us to build things, we don't charge for that. We just charge costs for that. And when it comes time to run it and promote, we just charge costs for that. We make the majority of our revenue by results. We're a results-based agency, something relatively new. I don't think anybody in international is doing it. I don't think many people are doing it at all. But with digital, we've found we can be very predictable with results. So uh, we kind of put our money where our mouth is. So when we recommend things like this, it, we have to feel as good about it as the client because we're kind of in, the, in this for the long haul. So, uh, so anyway, uh, map it out like this. Make it visual for investors. And what actually happened is when we kind of figured this out, we got on Skype and we met with them. We were in different parts of the world, but we met with the uh, stakeholders, the internal stakeholders at this gallery, and they immediately said, can you get on a plane, come to LA, and meet with some investors? And actually, we didn't end up meeting with some investors. They packed in three 
rooms full of investors and we spent the day going from room to room to room just telling this story. Um, and at the end of the day there was a bidding war and it actually worked out really, really well for this account. But the, but the, the point was that never would have happened unless we had made it visual like this. So uh, just to quickly summarize so we get on with the, with the panel. Um, key point, understand the market that you're entering. It's not about statistics and data, it's about getting out there, getting out on planes, getting on planes and asking your market. Uh, determining the market opportunities and threats, knowing your company's strengths and weaknesses, creating a solid growth strategy, making it visual for stakeholders like I just showed, and uh, leveraging the power of digital when implementing and managing it. So, uh, in any case, I want to thank the Tsar School of Business uh, and U.S. Commercial Services. We, we do a lot with them, and actually we're a client as well. We, uh, we have an aquaculture farm, a fish farm in uh, uh, Vietnam, and we went over there about a month ago. We go over there five, six, seven times a year to, to meet with them. We're turning a, a commodity, they basically sell the middlemen, and we're helping them turn it into an actual brand that, with their name in, in supermarkets. Um, and we actually call them commercial service. Susan Sedosha, Susan? Yeah. And she said, well, while you're over there, you, you want to meet with some people? And so it, they set up four appointments for us as an agency, made the calls. I know you guys know how that works, but it just astounds me that there is an organization that will do that for, um, you know, for, for an agency like us. So we went in and there was a translator there and there's somebody from the embassy there and it was unbelievable. We met with four people, the first one was a disaster, but the other three were fantastic. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, so we're very grateful to, to US Commercial Service, and not only for having me today, but for kind of having our back. So hopefully, uh, yeah, as, as, uh, as we mentioned, uh, I'm on the e-commerce export council, and we may be helping with an educational platform, so hopefully we'll be more involved with, uh, with all of you as time goes on. But in any case, thank you very much for having me. Um, thank you again, and uh, let you guys get on with the rest of your the, the conference here. But uh, thank you, and good luck this year. Thanks.